You're listening to the Fan to Fan Podcast, and on this episode, we're talking about actor, producer, the Cecil B. DeMille of the South, the one, the only, Earl Owensby. Here we go. Welcome to the Fan to Fan Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Bernie Gonzalez, and along with co-host extraordinaire Pete Charbonneau, we gave ourselves an assignment, an assignment to watch as many 80s 3D movies as possible. We, we didn't go for the obvious ones. Friday the 13th, Part 3, obviously in 3D, Jaws 3D, Amityville 3D. We decided to go down the road less traveled. Metal Storm, The Destruction of Jared Sin, Parasite 3D, Space Hunter, Adventures in the Forbidden Zone in 3D, Treasure of the Four Crowns in 3D. And along our way on our journey, we discovered the amazingness, the three-dimensional wonder that was Rottweiler, a.k.a. Dogs of Hell, by producer and actor Earl Owensby. Now, I know what you're thinking. Did we learn any lessons from watching Rottweiler, a.k.a. Dogs of Hell in 3D? And yes, we did. Uh, When you play God and you do military experiments on Rottweilers, uh, you know, dog's best friend, uh, sometimes it could not go your way and they might bite the hand that feeds them or tries to manipulate their thoughts. Uh, That was Rottweiler, a.k.a. Dogs of Hell. Movie, it was okay. It was an 80s flick. Didn't live up to what we were hoping it would be, you know, for a movie whose premise is basically Rottweilers that take the place of a slasher and hunt down people in like a beach town resort. So, I mean, amazing 80s fodder. And again, in 3D, we couldn't expect anything more than what we got. But the thing about Rottweiler, aka Dogs of Hell in 3D, was that it introduced us to Earl Owensby. So we hope you enjoy this episode dedicated to the man, the myth, the legend. Earl Owensby, yeah. Running into Rottweiler, okay, learning about Earl Owensby... I, I think that's the gift that has continued to keep on giving because um, I, I don't know if I should apologize. I sent Pete a just about hour and a half documentary on Earl Owensby, the man, the myth, available on YouTube. When you find out about him and you get more context about this man, the movies he's made, his place in the conversation with like Charles Band and Corman, Larry Cohen, Charles B. Pierce type, but very regional. But it seems like none of his movies. From the titles I saw, they never got into cult classic category. It seems like they were very much regional grindhouse drive through, but not movies that we would have run into at the video store or would have watched like late night. His movies never seemed to kind of get out of like the Southwest drive in circuit. Yeah, it reminded me. Yeah. And thank you for sending me that link because I wasn't planning on listening to the whole thing. But after a couple of minutes, <laughs> I, I was I was in. I mean, super interesting guy uh it reminded me a bit of like the, the early days of professional wrestling where they were like territories like this guy oh, good good call yeah north carolina film industry like covered like he was doing his thing down there he made quite a bit of money making his movies i, I think he starred in like over 35 films like you like one was like a kind of a knockoff of walking tall called yep. challenge i think frank challenge of- that was the one. So that came out in like 73. I saw Walking Tall. People say Gone with the Wind influenced me. Gone with the Wind didn't influence me at all. Walking Tall influenced me. Because Walking Tall was made over in McMinnville, Tennessee for about a million three hundred thousand dollars with Joe Don Baker playing Buford Purser. And the sucker did about forty million. Now forty million back then was a whole lot of money. We wasn't into these hundred million dollar mega buck blockbusters at that time. And uh, I said, that's the kind of film I need to do. And then certainly a product of its time when you think about like Billy Jack and fighting the man and the one lone person against corruption and trying to get revenge. From what I saw in the trailer for Challenge, and then he ends up making a sequel, I think called Manhunter. Joe Don Baker, like Owensby, like not that far off in the group picture from each other in tone and in look. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, again, like I think you and I are both fairly well schooled in a lot of different genres and a lot of different history of, of film. We've been schooled ourselves. Um, Nick Dyack uh, comes to mind schooling us on Italian cinema. By no means are we completists or are we um, 
you know, historians of all this stuff, but we've seen a lot of movies. And again, like to, to discover someone that had and created like this really successful niche and area of the country in the 70s and 80s is, is really fascinating. I'm not going to recommend everyone listen to the whole hour and 30 minute documentary because your your mileage may vary on whether you find this guy interesting at all. But it, it does. A, it definitely does. <laughs> there's a point where it's like, you know, the voiceover is like, and then Earl Owens B bought, purchased uh, an unused nuclear power plant. <laughs> and it's just like, what? And to, to round this into something that listeners will understand, this power plant shell was used as a site for the underwater scenes for the abyss and i don't remember exactly how he got involved in in making that i think he even got sued for something with mm-hmm. the uh, with the making of that but like he dipped his toe into major productions but he also was very I, much i see what you did there <laughs> remember you can find the fan to fan podcast at www.fanpodcast.com facebook just search fan to fan podcast that's F A N, the number two, F A N, on Instagram at Fan to Fan Podcast, or on Twitter at Fan to Fan Podcast. We'd love to hear from you, so send a message and let us know what you think of the show. Thanks. And now, on with the show. A, ho- a Hollywood outsider, and it seemed to want to do it that way because I think he had a lot more control over making the movies that he wanted to make. And he was yes. all about, you know, let's just use local people. Uh, we'll keep it local to North Carolina, make the movies that we want to make. We can churn and burn these things really quick. We'll film for two weeks. I'll edit it in my basement. We'll get That's it out. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, we can get this on the circuit and make a nice tidy profit without, you know, mm-hmm. having to do a ton of extra work and have to play the Hollywood game. Earl has proven that a person doesn't have to live in the entertainment capitals, Los Angeles or New York, or even have his movies shown there to be successful in the film business. Some in the industry refer to his films as regional pictures, which is not exactly high praise. Some go so far to call them billy flicks, redneck shoot 'em ups or grit westerns. But Earl himself calls them tasteful, grassroots entertainment. I give this guy a ton of credit, like sound like a super, super interesting guy. And yeah, I, you know, uh, heretofore had never even heard of the name. Mm-hmm. It's you, you mentioned if you end up watching this YouTube documentary, Pete said it best. It, if this was not commissioned by Earl Owens B, I think we would both be surprised because uh, it was very complimentary 90% of the time. And even if it's criticism seemed to pull a few punches. So I think that's something kind of the disclaimer that goes with it. But you almost... Uh, like everything you were saying, Pete, like the fact that the success comes from never spending a million dollars to make a film and sign- never signing a distribution deal that would net him less than $8 million. Well, I have no question about it. Uh, Earl went into the motion picture industry because it had been a love of his from the very beginning. But he did it principally as a financial venture. And uh, as Earl says, economics is easy. You don't spend as much as you take in. And he was able to do that and build a very successful studio. I think for an industry, right, in Hollywood, where there's a lot of glitz and glamour, it seems like this guy was very pragmatic in his filmmaking and looking at it from a very economical sense. If I cast myself instead of Burt Reynolds as the main character... I get to save a lot of money and probably to be fair to him, he probably gets to dictate the pace of the production, the editing, uh, save a lot, certainly a lot of money, but a lot of time, which allows him to then make other films. And because Challenge does so well where you get a movie like Billy Jack in 71 and then you get uh, Walking Tall, uh, got to check my notes here. I do not immediately know off the top of my head when Walking Tall came out. 73. but yeah. so, So those are early 70s. And then he's smart enough to release a challenge in 73 as well, because then if the theater is packed with people watching Walking Tall, they walk out. What would they like to do? Either watch Walking Tall again, watch the sequel. And if the sequel is not ready, they'll watch Challenge. And, you know, to take advantage of that, very smart. I mean, you could say it's, you know, uh, him just taking advantage of the trend, just like Rottweiler that we talked about, like the 3D trend, Animals Amok trend. But hearing about this guy, what he was able to do, the movies that he did, throwing out names out there, The Brass Ring, Dark Sunday, Death Driver, Chain Gang, Tales of the Third Dimension. I think you would agree, Pete. I I have not heard of any of these films at all. 
Not no, one. Not, not one. A- and that, you know, in our continued exercise in going through these 3D movies, that he produces six 3D movies. I saw that. My heart almost sank. I'm like, shit, we got to watch these things. <laughs> I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, okay, Rottweiler in 83, something called Hot Air 1984, which again, just sounds like a Three Stooges sketch. Chain Gang in 1984, where he, surprise, surprise, Earl Owens B. stars as like a bounty hunter that's imprisoned for the wrong reasons and then fight against the very people he put in prison when he's put in a chain gang. I'm like, okay, that's fair. Uh, it ain't so Earl. It, hyperspace, aka Gremloids, that has like Paula Poundstone in it. And we kind of mentioned that a few times. Not that either one have seen it, but that was in 84. Hit the road running in 87. Tales of the Third Dimension in 84. So dude goes out there and buys this equipment, figures out how to do the 3D thing. And I guess maybe that's another good business decision. I've got the equipment. I'm not going to just use it once. I might as well use it until I can't use it anymore. Then it's 84. I don't know what year Jaws 3D came out, but we've kind of heard from stories like Jaws 3D was kind of the nail in the coffin for this trend. He says it in the documentary. That's right. That's kind yes. of pissed. Three-dimensional pictures was an idea that had come of age, and Earl began production on the first 3D movie shot in the United States in 25 years. And even though his version was an updated technique and a great improvement over the old 1950s method, this was one of the few times that Owensby didn't face things realistically. This was one time when Earl Owensby's Golden Touch didn't even bring in silver. Other studios caught the bandwagon and began flooding the market with 3D releases like Friday the 13th in 3D and Amityville 3D. All these things hit, and the one that really killed it was Jaws 3 in 3D. Terrible movie. Technically terrible, terrible, terrible. And they just went out mass with it, 1,500, 2,000 prints. You can't do that on 3D. And I blame that is one thing that happened. The other thing that happened is they go into multiplexes and 3D has to be tweaked. The projections has to make sure that the frame is where the frame is supposed to be. If you don't, you don't have 3D. Your convergence is off. They wouldn't do that. It's like if it wasn't for Jaws 3D being a bad movie, and then also, you know, the technical piece of having to have projectionists try to align the picture to take advantage of, you know, the thing in the title, the 3D piece. Uh, Who knows? This guy could have had a dozen 3D films, but my God, like even Charles Band doesn't have six 3D films, but Earl Owensby does. Um, So yeah, when I think of that picture, Cohen, Band, Charles B. Pierce, Corman, I, I have to now start thinking like, yeah, Owensby is part of that group picture. Yeah, without a doubt. I, I, I did find it uh, funny when one of his friends in the documentary was like, if he played the game, he could have been Burt Reynolds. I'm like, <laughs> like probably not. <laughs> yeah. And, and the fact that he plays Elvis and actually seems to sing and brings in Ray Orbison, Western legends to kind of be part of his productions. He had his roots in that outsider industry that you mentioned. Like, But ultimately, again, he didn't have to sell as many tickets as a Burt Reynolds would because he could get away with making a smaller movie at a smaller budget and still making a profit. Yeah. Again, for where he was in in the Carolinas, he had that region where there was a following. There was an audience for the type of movies that you and I and maybe most people never heard of, but clearly he was able to make a, a career out of it. But let's remember, when I went in the movie business, I had only one place to go with my movie, and that was to either the, the theaters or the drive-ins, or I didn't go. I mean, there was no video, there was no cable, uh, there was no place like Home Box Office Showtime, there was no uh, no pay-per-view, uh, none of that stuff exists. And uh, so to roll those dice and get into that business at that time, I think, and build a studio in Shelby, North Carolina, would probably have been a, a million to one shot at least, yeah. Earl Owensby will tell you in no uncertain terms that he knows where he came from, he knows where he's been, and probably where he's going. And if you cross him, he may well tell you where you can go. He wasn't a filmmaker by trade. Like he, I forget, he came out of the Army and was doing like sales or something like that, ran right. for office, lost uh, an election, and then was just kind of like, yeah, you know, I think I'm just going to make a movie, and, and did. I had no idea how to do it, and just 
you know, went and churned out a, a bunch of stuff. So again, like a self-made man from that standpoint. When you get through his history, you know, he was basically given up as a as an infant and yep. his mother committing suicide, finding out his father was dead. There certainly seems to be like a lot of tragedy in his early years coming from a place of poverty and class issues. And it seems like there was a lot of stuff going on in his life, but certainly have made a, a name for himself, a, a legacy in that documentary. They talk about, you know, people like Tarantino and Spielberg being aware of him. All right. Well, this is a good looking cover. A freakish army experiment out of control terrorizes a resort town. An idyllic resort community has been ravaged by an unimaginable terror. Horribly mangled bodies are littering the countryside. The ensuing gruesome investigation leads a puzzled sheriff to the local university and to a fantastic, terrible secret. It seems the killers are a renegade horde of Rottweilers. (laughs) Oh, if you don't know it by then, I don't think you're going to get this one. Okay. Uh, there's a, quite a few killer dog movies, all right? Mm-hmm. But I'm going to say it's the Earl Ozenby film, Rottweiler. Take a look. It is Dogs, Dogs of, of Hell. hell. <laughs> Kelly, let me see that one for a second. Yeah, you can have that. Now, one is, uh, <laughs> who directed this? Oh, I'm right. Nobody directed I'm right. it. Earl Lozenby. Oh, that was the Earl original Lozenby. title. The original title was called Rottweiler. That's the cheapy video title. That's the cheapy video title. Look at that. The Let's original zoom in on that. There you go. Earl Lozenby. It was originally, oh my God. It was originally God. called Rottweiler in 3D. Unbelievable. It feels like a Tarantino or Spielberg would know who this guy is because they would have heard of his movies or his legacy. So maybe I'm done from not having heard of this guy before, but if you haven't, then welcome to the club. Um, maybe watch some of this documentary and you'll be as, as impressed as Pete and I were. Yeah. So, yeah. So again, like Rottweiler, the the movie, not that great, but we <laughs> were able to find some interesting things that, that came out of this that we did not know before. So, uh, you know, I feel more enriched that we've seen it now. Another 3D movie off our list that wasn't even on our list and an hour and a half documentary off on our list. So our yeah. our YouTube watching history is getting quite interesting, Pete. Yeah. <laughs>